So, um, first of all, it's excellent to be here. I'm normally uh, hidden in a dark room, hammering out Java code, uh, simulating disease and pestilence. So it's fantastic to actually be in front of real people that are apparently healthy. <laughs> so I'm at the Centre of Excellence, uh, the Biosecurity Risk Analysis in Melbourne at SEBRA. And I'm going to talk to you today about a new decision support tool called Aptus. And it's uh, uh, specifically for plant pests. But it all began with the ATIS model, which was mentioned um, briefly before. So what I thought I might do, if you could just indulge me, I'll just spend a few minutes running the ATIS model um, as a, an introduction to the Aptus model. So I'm going to run an FMD simulation. Oh, and if we could turn the lights out, that would be fantastic, just to get a bit of contrast. So what I've just done there is I've started the ATIS model. There's 250-odd thousand herds in Australia that we're simulating. And, um, oh, well, it, this may be a bit, little bit hard to see if the lights are getting better. Okay, so this is an agent-based model, and an agent in this context is a herd of animals of the same species and production system. So we've loaded up what we view as the, the set of herds in Australia, and what I'm going to do is drop the FMD virus into a particular herd. So that the orange dot there is where we're infecting a set of pigs in uh, the Golden Valley. Now if I hit play, the first thing that happens is we start spreading disease uh, along the pathways that the FMD experts fear it may spread. So uh, primarily direct contacts informed through the NIS uh, database. Uh, so farm to farm, farm to sale yard. Uh, indirect uh, local spread mysteriously between neighbouring properties. Airborne spread if the conditions are right. And of course amplification uh, in sale yards. So that's the arrows uh, vectoring away. And then to counter that, we throw the uh, control measures as defined by OSVET plan. So the, the eggs that you see forming there, the fried eggs, are the restricted areas and controlled areas. Uh, the flashing dots are different uh, assignations for premises. For example, uh, there may be a, a report of clinical signs. Uh, so that becomes an SP. Uh, a tracing uh, mechanism may have highlighted a risk premises, so the TPs or DCPs. Uh, if we choose to vaccinate, there'll be vaccinated premises, and of course, stamping out uh, will occur. So that just completed 10 iterations, and as it's a stochastic model, every single iteration is different. So uh, what you see here in the, the blue and red bars are the distribution starting to form as we stochastically iterate over that given scenario. So I'll just run it once more. And down the bottom left, that is the actual emergent behaviour of the agent-based model. At each flash of yellow and red is one outbreak. The yellow are the actual infected farms. The red are the detected and uh, processed um, uh, inf uh, farms per OSVET plan. Uh, over here, we constrain the response to the outbreak. So the bars that are flashing up is reflecting the level of effort that the response team has to go through. It also tells us how well we're doing and how much it's costing. So if we can't get surveillance teams out to find disease, uh, those jobs queue up and it uh, constrains or thwarts the efficiency of the response. Uh, in the bottom left, uh, this particular scenario, we're doing emergency vaccination. So we have a national vaccine pool uh, so we can uh, test the different levels of vaccine um, as to when they're available and how much might be consumed. So why on earth do we do this? And, I mean, it's, it's fun, it's taken years, a lot of people um, uh, helped uh, develop that. But the whole point is it's a complex system and that FMD could turn up, or any pathogen or nasty pest, could turn up at a variety of places, at a variety of times of year, um, and it will behave differently because of different strains, different species, host species, uh, different marketing systems different production systems, FMD and a dairy cow and Gipps land will be quite different to a, a big ranch uh, in, the in the top end. Uh, there's a, a variety of control options. 
So what we have is this complex system, which is rather hard to unpack for a mortal. So we have simulations such as this that allow policymakers to do virtual experiments um, with a control strategy against the distribution of possible um, outbreaks for a given scenario. So it's a virtual lab, if you like. So we can, with a model such as this, um, we can try different things. And I have to stop talking, but I'm just going to do one more. So I'm t enabling post-outbreak management. So this time, the outbreak goes beyond the resolution of the, um, of the control program. And we see the post-outbreak management, the flashes of coloured purples are the clusters of disease that are being serologically uh, sampled and clinically sampled to gain a statistical confidence as to whether the disease is still present uh, in the population. A whole lot of things. We can try different uh, vaccination strategies, different uh, quarantine strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a peacetime decision support tool. So that is ATIS. And where we're at is Aptus. Now, I did, I did have a move, but I've just got to stop that. See, and this is why I was running it, because the movies, unfortunately, flicker. Sorry about that. So since we developed ATIS, it began in 2012, it's expanded to other infectious animal diseases, vector-borne diseases, plant pests uh, with the Aptus model, uh, human disease, and other countries. There's a range of countries that we're collaborating with, um, mainly with FMD, but also we're starting to look at swine, African swine fever, classical swine fever. So this is a snapshot of the model operating in a different mode, a geographical automata. Um, that is the spread of a midge uh, as a potential vector of blue tongue. This is a project that I'm working with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, uh, spreading rotavirus in the Indonesian um, uh, region. And we're looking at different uh, vaccine strategies, so neonatal versus uh, infant uh, strategies. So again, just testing control policies against what we think is the underlying spread mechanisms. And if all else, all else fails, I'm going to sell infection networks uh, on T-shirts at the local market. So I'll see you there and expect your custom. <laughs> so that's a, that's a sort of an influenza-style uh, recurrent outbreak. But the, the uh, infection network uh, is quite something. So finally, we're at Aptus. And um, this is an offshoot of the original ATIS model. It's the same modelling framework, but instead of agent-based, it's geographic automata. And the goal here was to come up with a framework. Um, so we're not in any way presenting a model to say this is how it's going to happen. We're presenting a tool that people in the space can hopefully run with and do useful things. Now, geographic automata is just simply viewing a problem space as a grid. And uh, in the animal model, the modeling unit of interest was a herd. And in this uh, context, it's a cell. So we just look at how we're going to represent mathematically a pest within a cell. So it could be 10 hectares or 1 hectare or uh, 100 hectares or whatever is appropriate uh, for the data. And we say that it's got a variety of attributes, um, vegetation, elevation, temperature, et cetera, whatever is relevant to the pest. And here we've got two mathematical representations of the abundance of that pest over time. So days on the x-axis normalised population density in the Y. So that's just simply a metric between 0 and 1 of the amount of uh, pest that's in there, the density of the pest. Uh, the bottom one is temperature-dependent growth. So you can see that it goes down in, um, in winter. We get a, a die-off in winter, and then it springs back up in uh, spring. Now, the interesting part of this is that as the population builds up, you get a dispersal pressure. So that's akin to an infectious pressure, and it's the likelihood that it's going to spill over into an adjoining cell. And it may spill over in two ways. Uh, diffusive spread, so that could be this through something like budding. 
And we have the option, if there's no data or no knowledge, we can just mathematically progress the pest over time and space in a very uh, predictable manner. But if we have uh, data, experience, and people that can uh, provide insight, the model offers uh, this feature of um, making a more complex diffusion. So, for example, if we're modeling a tramp ant, we can uh, progress that steady budding at a different rate in a wilderness area uh, to a, a railway corridor, to an urban area. Um, we can take into account elevation, you know, if critters care about whether they're going uphill or downhill. Uh, so these are just dials that the modeler uh, sets up. And then the longer, more unpredictable spread uh, is a jump process. So that could be a human-mediated hitchhiking. And again, if there's no data or knowledge, uh, we can just jump it in a random direction at a random time for a random distance, but hopefully we can do better. Uh, we can look at where our outlying colonies have emerged and deduce the sort of distances that they're hitchhiking. Uh, and the model offers a range of uh, features there to build in. Um, I'll just pick out one. So if uh, human population density for a particular cell has a lot of people versus few people, that informs the stochastic decision of whether a jump will or will not occur. So that's uh, the Aptus model, just a screenshot of um, uh, jump diffusion occurring. I won't play a, a movie because of that problem, but at the end I'll, I'll actually run the Aptus model. Um, so again, back to the animal case. We've, uh, if, if the experts are comfortable that we're spreading disease in a plausible manner or uh, spreading a pest, now's the time to test our policies. So in the plant world, we simulate uh, general surveillance um, which, of course, will be influenced by the, the level of pest and the level of people in a cell and the sensitivity or, you know, the, how refined the observer is to recognise that that's a, a pest that should be reported. Uh, specificity is to how, how bad they are at recognising it. Uh, we uh, can um, do early detection surveillance based on the trapping grid. Uh, the... So the trapping grid is just read in as a data layer, so it's what we think is, well, what I was told is the current fruit fly trapping grid, but that's negotiable. It can be an experimental trapping grid that we want to test out. And uh, in both cases, uh, true-false positive triggers a control process and a true-false negative, uh, we assume that the pest is absent. Delimiting surveillance, um, we can experiment with things such as the spacing of the traps, uh, the cost of the traps, how sensitive the traps are. The treatment program, uh, we configure, the user configures a set number of treatments at a certain interval over a treatment period. And each treatment will reduce the population stochastically. And again, that's uh, as informed by the, the person that's configuring and using the model as to what treatment they're simulating and testing out. Now, resourcing, the animal people love this. I'm not quite sure about the plant people yet. Um, it's new territory, but certainly we want to know if we have enough resources to handle a particular incursion. So a resource is an abstract concept. It can be a helicopter, it could be a person, or a detection dog, or a truck, or whatever's relevant to the problem. And the user just defines how many of these things are needed to do a certain job. If the thing is available, then the control action proceeds. If it's not available, it queues up, as it would in real life, and the efficacy of the control program is thwarted, of course, by the inability to respond to the outbreak. We can unlimit the um, resourcing in the model. In that case, the model then tells you uh, what resourcing was required. So the, the top one, the cyan is the delimiting surveillance resources. It was capped at 40, so in that point, it impeded our response. So for that particular scenario, it took, I think, 20 years to control. Um, and in this bottom one, I let it run free. So it actually peaks at about 75 of these resources for delimiting, and it, uh, it eradicated, I think, in 10 years, just as a, as a contrast. So these are dials that you can play with as a model user. Everything's costed, um, so an example would be a pest treatment in a certain cell for a certain treatment um, technique uh, needs a certain number of resources over a certain period at a certain cost. And we do that for the various surveillance and uh, treatment components. 
and then the, at the end of it, the model spits out uh, summaries of how much it cost and how well we did with respect to control. So that's just a screen grab. I will play, I'll, I'll run the model at the end just when I'm finished discussing it. Um, but down the bottom, you can see that was the, that's the equivalent of those uh, pyramids that were for the animal model with the uh, known infected and declared. Uh, the orange is the number of controlled cells or managed cells. The purple is the number of cells that actually have the pest. And again, why are we doing this? So our hope is that the people actually doing the real work can make use of this to conduct experiments and ask very specific questions in a disaggregated model such as this where we're simulating individual aspects. It enables you to test individual aspects. So you've got a lot of user dials. Um, and an example that in yellow is the one that I'm just looking at. If we change the trap spacing, what happens? So just quickly, that was the study, because I'm running out of time. So these are the, the pathways for the trampant. Uh, there's no, no trapping grid, so there's just uh, general surveillance. And that was how it was configured. So that's an ex that's, I think that's not particularly realistic, but it's, it's an example. Very the spacing of the post-outbreak, uh, post-treatment surveillance traps between two meters and 100 meters. And that's what the model told us. So the x-axis is the trap spacing in meters uh, going from zero to 100. So obviously, if we're spacing them very tightly, the cost goes up, which is the red line. If we're spacing them further apart, the cost is less prohibitive. The blue y-axis is the population reduction uh, relevant or matching with the trap spacing. The green line is incursion duration. So we can see some interesting information uh, forming here uh, in that the that bar there is where the simulation was capped, so we couldn't go beyond 15 years, which means that for trap spacing of 20 metres and above, we did not eradicate the tramp ant. Trap spacing less than that we did, but of course at a much greater cost. And I believe economists love these J-curves. Uh, they go weak at the knees, Professor Tom Compass particularly. Um, so that's the sort of analysis that perhaps economists and policymakers can, can play with. And again, I'm not in any way saying that that's the magic figure for trap spacing, because that's just me using the model as an example. But hopefully it inspires people doing the real work to think that they might be able to make use of that model. It's stochastic, so we build up distributions. We run a 1,000, perhaps, iterations. Um, that might take an hour to, to run. On the left is one iteration of a tramp ant and on the right is the model producing a risk map for 100 iterations. So you see the red areas is the high risk, uh, going through to blue areas is low risk. And I'm dreadfully embarrassed, but we've run out of time. Um, but if you'd like to see the model aptest run later, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, or I could do it now and just cheat. Just hmm? Just All right, let's just quickly. I that's the whole point I came. It would be very embarrassing if I didn't actually run it. So I'm going to run the tramp ant models because it's uh, easier to look at. So this is a regional study of tramp ants. That's the initial population there. Each of these cells has a, a story to tell. Um, you know, there's attributes, there's a population, and I'll just pick one. So there's the mathematical curve inside that cell that's approximating uh, the population abundance. And then I shall run it. So what's happening? The, the flashing lights are those mechanisms that we've just discussed all going in parallel. So the whole premise of an agent-based model such as this is we simulate individual aspects and we just throw them together and let them collide and the emergent behaviour is the goodness. So what's happening in the bottom left is the emergent behaviour where the purple line is the population declining over time, so number of cells that have a pest. The orange line is the number of managed cells which peaks. Um, so a managed cell is any cell that's subject to delimiting surveillance treatment or, or um, uh, post-treatment surveillance. You can see in this one, the resources are capped, so it's uh, bumped up ceiling at 40 uh, resources for delimiting surveillance, 
and the, some of the other emergent behaviour is over here. So we get uh, reports on true and false negatives in the different um, uh, components, how well we did the limiting surveillance. The cost is down here and the duration, how long it took. So that's 10 sim years. And based on this particular scenario, eradication occurred at 10 years for that um, blend of control. So we would repeat that a thousand times and then statistically analyze um, what we think covers the range of potential distributions and reactions with control. Yes, yes, sorry, it's a bit rushed, but the green is where it's been treated. Um, so they're deemed absent of uh, post-treatment surveillance, and the blue is the delimiting surveillance where we've deemed it to be free of the pest. And, of course, we throw into the mix true and false positives, true and false negatives, <laughs> reflecting imperfections in the system, and then uh, how well we catch imperfections, you know, either through early detection or general surveillance subsequently. I'd better stop. So thank you very much.